Praise the Lord. Now, the key to everything, and we're going to have some testimonies this morning. I've already talked to a few people about just sharing what God said to them, um, you know, during this Daniel fast. The key, and everyone will tell you this, the central key toward growing as a person, toward getting freed up from your false self, from ruling and reigning in life, the key is Jesus Christ. Jesus. Now, um, so we're going to call today Jesus Christ our magnificent obsession. Now, Christ comes to us directly. We can meet the living God and know him and hear his voice and walk with him. And honestly, here's what you want. You want a relationship with Jesus that is so deep and real that you're contagious. You're contagious. Like, like out of your pores, out of your face, out of your voice, you can't help but emit Jesus. Okay, you're contagious. So like COVID, it's kind of a, you know, if there's a negative contagiousness, like this, whatever Omicron is called. I mean, it's pretty contagious, right? You sneeze, and then, you know, 100 people get it. All right, so what if, what if you were so contagious, filled with the love of Jesus, that you just kind of, and 100 people meet Jesus? I mean, I know that sounds nuts, but why not? If, it's, if a bug can do it, why can't we? So aspire to that. Aspire to say, man, I want to be lit up in love and with this Jesus. Now, here's the thing. So much of Jesus gets transmitted through skin, through people. Now, that's the complicated part. If it was just Jesus and you, hey, at least one of you is perfect. So you're good to go there, okay? If you, if you, you and Jesus, wow, okay? At least one of the, one of the equations. For, but what if Jesus says, now here's the deal. I'm going to emit my grace I'm going to transfer my grace through well-connected hearts. So you got to get connected and attached, and then I'm going to flow through everyday people that are just as messed up as you, maybe more. But if you want to get a big chunk of me, you got to mess around with people. you got to hook up with them. you got to connect with them. Not just a superficial thing, but long-term. Now, the, 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 the initial connecting part is easy. Right? I mean, you can go up and smile, and if you delight in somebody at the store or on the street, there's going to be some joy exchanged right away. There's going to be some grace happening. The initial connection with a new friend is not that hard. The hard part is sustaining the joy when you get offended, when you get hurt, when you get when you unmet expectations. So the whole thing is going to rely on how deeply interested we are in Jesus. Can you be so interested in Jesus that you're willing to find Christ in somebody you don't like? Now that's, the, that's called an enemy. You'd be in enemy mode. Can you dig down past their quirks and weirdness and weakness and find the Christ in that person you don't like that much? Can you mine that kind of gold? What if Christ has a chunk of his, himself hidden inside of an, an obnoxious person that you have to go find? And <clears throat> you've got to hunt him down and drag it out. That's crazy to think. But that's so much God's ways because he loves humility. He loves humility and he requires it to grow in character. So I'm going to lead, read one passage, then I'm going to invite a few people up to just talk about, uh, and Derek, you're going to be first. Is that cool? <clears throat> I love picking on Derek. He's my favorite picker on her. Jesus Christ, I'm in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Our magnificent obsession. Here's what it says about this man Christ Jesus. He is the image, the physical representation, the image of the invisible God. I'm in Colossians 1.15. He is the firstborn over all creation. He's the first physical entity that ever came out of the Trinity. Before the stars, before the galaxies, he was the first entity that ever came out of the unseen realm out of the Trinity. 
He's the firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus Christ, once he became some kind of a material essence, then he himself created all things. All the material realm came from the man Christ Jesus. Woo! Does that make you tingly? For by, how many of you like nature? Come on. Well, you better thank him. Because he was the one that made it. For by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible. That means the angels he made. Whether thrones or rulers or powers or authorities. All things were created by him. Now get this. And for him. Because he's God, he can't act like he's not God, so he had to make everything for himself. That's not egotism, that's just substantial. Everything was created for worship. It was created by him, but then it was created for him. He made you for him. You don't belong to you, you belong to him, but your highest joy will be living for him. Because he made you that way. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Literally, if this word wasn't proceeding from him, you'd vaporize. He's holding your molecules together. And he is the head of the body, the church. That's why he loves the bride. You've got to love the bride like he loves the bride. You don't get to dislike the church because it's hurt you. Okay, he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Just say the word supremacy. Supremacy. I'm going to tell you something. Your life will go um, well proportionate to the degree Christ has supremacy. What a thought. Because you're created for giving him worship and supremacy, so to the degree that he's supreme is the degree to which your life will go well. All right, beautiful. Praise the Lord. Now, um, Derek, come on up here. Everybody say, hey, Derek. What has Jesus been saying to you during this Daniel fast? What are you getting from the Lord? Any verses, any thoughts? Boom. Uh, first off, I have to confess that I kind of did like Daniel fast light this year. <laughs> so I feel like I was kind of easy on the, on the flesh. I, I kind of wimped out and all I, I just did like, <laughs> I just did like, you know, no coffee and then like not a lot of, I cut out the dessert. So anyway, um, but I was trying to focus on just like feasting on the word, you know, and, um, and just, um, spending time and I found this app that Josh told me about a year ago called dwell where you can just like listen to audio Bible and that, mm-hmm. that's been really helpful um, but then um, yeah just this morning like it was awesome you know we kind of we were doing that we were praying for Curtis and um, initially I, I wasn't really feeling much but I just kind of like by faith went over and then when we got over there I don't know about everybody else that was over there but I really felt like I could sense the Holy Spirit all of a sudden. Um, and, I mean, Curtis, his testimony was Jesus healed him this morning. So, I mean, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So, Christ is alive and well. Um, and then, what else? I guess, I took some notes here. Um, okay, so, one thing that, one way that God speaks to me sometimes is through, like, music. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll wake up in the morning with a song in my heart or in my spirit that I haven't heard for a long time. And so there's this kind of old song now, because I'm kind of old now. Uh, <laughs> hey, easy boy. <laughs> you just alienated three-fourths of this church. <laughs> <laughs> it's all relative, right? No. Easy, um, how did that hit you? <laughs> whatever. It's, so this, song, this song's from like 2005 or something, from, from Leland. It's called, it's called Tears of the Saints. And... Um, I don't, it's, has anybody heard that song? Um, so there's a guy, yeah, Leland Mooring, I think he's from Texas, and um, he, so the song is like, there are many prodigal sons, on our city streets they run, um, people's hopes 
shattered to the ground, families broken down, you know, from failures. This is an emergency. This, that's like the, this is an emergency. There are, there are tears from the saints for the lost and unsaved. Um, crying, people crying, Father, lead them home. Father, lead them home. And it's kind of just become a reminder to me. I think it's really easy for me to get um, very self-focused and introspective and building my own kingdom and comfortable world. And, and um, Jesus, I think, is reminding me through that song of like, hey, I have a bigger, I have a bigger mission in mind uh, that involves um, the lost and unsaved. It involves um, prodigal sons returning to the father. And, and so, um, yeah, that's, that's just been, I feel like God's just been expanding my vision to see like, a, to basically to, ha- to build a family to, yes. to be able to welcome the lost and the prodigal into and to build a team of disciples who are, you know, imperfect human beings like you and me, broken with our faults, who are seeking Jesus with our whole hearts and encouraging one another daily to, to go after him. So I love that. So, yeah, um, that's pretty much. So pray for that on the family right there. Uh, just summarize in a prayer, a couple sentence prayer. Just release it onto our church, Terry, because I feel like that's a word from the Lord. So, Father, this morning, we just thank you that you are, you're good, and you are in our midst. And, Father, that your heart is of love is so big, and, God, your capacity to love the broken, your capacity to love the lost, your capacity and willingness to pick us up when we've blown it and to forgive us and to restore us and to remind us who we are. Uh, is so amazing, God. So we just worship you this morning, God, and we thank you that you are, um, you've given us a mission, you've given us an assignment to be your ambassadors on the earth, to be agents of hope and encouragement and representatives of of heaven on earth. Um, So Father, anoint us for this work. God, we can't do this without you. We can't do this without you, God. We need you. We're desperate for you. We're desperate for your glory, God, we just want to be, we want to be your servants, Lord, because you're so good. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Derek. I love that. Everybody, thank the Lord. So, uh, again, we're keeping these kind of, Tim, did you have, did you, okay, come on up. I wasn't sure if you were going to, everybody say, hey, Tim. Hey, Tim. <laughs> Yeah, so as I was reflecting on um, the Daniel Fest this year, um, you know, nothing immediately was standing out to me. But then as I, you know, thought about it a little bit more, one of the big things at the beginning of the Daniel Fest that was on my heart was to build a life of um, more discipline. And that comes from a heart where I was recognizing where, you know, the, the, the passage, I keep doing the things I do not want to do, you know. And I was like, well, how do I not do that? Well, I need more discipline to make better choices. Mm-hmm. And as I reflect back, I've recognized that I've established so far um, during this Daniel Fest um, several new patterns in my life. Um, and it's really been... Um, it's it's simple, but it was actually quite profound for me. But it it was all through the empowering grace of God. Um, you know, we talk about grace a lot, and we extend grace and all this. But it's also there's you know, grace is empowering. It is the enabling force that Jesus gave, gives us to do the things we cannot do on our own. And so, um, for me, that's been. Yeah, setting up these new patterns of behavior or new um, disciplines, yeah. such as, you know, Jamie and I are getting up three days a week and doing a little devotional together, um, just as a simple example. But there's been several of those that have been established during the Daniel Fest. Um, another one 
is, you know, when I have devotionals in the morning, I try to speak in tongues for five minutes. Um, you know, so little things, but I've only been able to establish them through grace. And so. Come on, is that cool? <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, I love the idea of building in new lifestyle habits. That was a, that's a great concept. Um, Mono, my, our coolest friend, you know, Mono Basuj, he decided that his brain wasn't defaulting to gratitude quick enough. So he wasn't counting at all joy when he encountered various trials. And so he said, I'm going to begin to retool my brain to get grateful because my, my default is to see the problems. So he set his alarm on his phone for every hour. And every hour, the alarm went off, and it forced him to start thanking God. Every hour, he would burst into gratitude. And um, he said he did that for about 21 days, and suddenly he could literally feel his spirit expand. His mind started getting healthier and less toxic. And his brain, the, so his first reaction, what, rather than grumbling, started becoming praising. And it honestly kept his relational circuits open so he could see the, the Lord clear and appropriate his grace more. So that's what, that's what I'm saying, that the power of a habit is, is one of those things. It's not like a resolution, like I'm going to lose 20 pounds. It's more like I want to build a new pattern or a new way of living, a new mindset that takes me into the way I age, the way I deal with people. So, Tim, thank you. That was really good. Both of you guys, thank you. All right. Come on. Step up here, dear Liz. Everybody say, hey, Liz. Hey. <laughs> First off, I stayed with the Daniel Fast, which to me was amazing. Because if ever a time to not fast physically, it would have been now. Mm -hmm. My brother passed, mm -hmm. and but the the physical was not hard. I had no gastrointestinal <laughs> stuff. I had no no pain. Hey, that's I usually a big deal, stomach, everybody. What that? I usually get stomach aches. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was totally no caffeine, no nothing. I had no sleep, but I had no caffeine, <laughs> and I was like, <coughs> but I didn't have issues with it all and I was just amazed God is so good um, there was a lot of hard times but I'm not going into those I want to tell you the God moments um, I, my niece talked about a, a letter she was writing her dad and didn't get to send it so I thought that's what I need to do I need to write my brother mm. what a healing process mm. I'm not all the way healed, but what a healing process. Yeah. Um, and then I was spreading that throughout the family. Write a letter, write a letter. You know, um, finding tools to go through things. So, I, of course, I was journaling God about everything. And he came up with, um, to me, Lord, you gave us each other for a reason. Mm to be in relationship, to trust one another with our wounds. Relationship has been on my heart this whole time. Mm -hmm. Relationship, talking, don't hide, don't, don't seclude yourself, don't. Mm -hmm. I spent a couple nights with um, his wife and child, um, just <laughs> got home yesterday. A um, couple of God moments. During the 911 call, at, towards the end, she was, my sister-in-law was really frantic. Where are they? Where are they? She didn't know in her mind what really had happened. And so that he was gone already, but she was hopeful. And the lady asked to pray with her. On 911? On 911. Now, they're in Florence, Florescent, Colorado, and it's a small community. And I just was blown away. Um, my sister-in-law has wrote on my brother's Christianity. You know, he got really strong with the, with the Lord in relationship. He talked to me about never having that before. 
as a grown man, he had found the relationship. He had a cowboy church up there, loved it, Bible study. She started going to the study since he's passed. I'm just blown away. God is present everywhere, and he shows you everywhere you are in your deepest moments, and I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful to see him everywhere, you know, and, and I look for him everywhere. So my big word is relationship. Everybody needs relationship and, and not, not surface relationship, deep conversations, you know, relationship like we have with the Lord but with each other, you know. Very important. Beautiful. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much, love. Hey, let's just pray for Liz right now and the family. It's, it's, it is a extremely traumatic what they've been through. Father, we just ask for the comfort that only you can bring. Father, we, we pray release that on Liz and her sister, Deb, on the family, on, on her sister-in-law and her niece. We ask for grace, Lord, and redeem this, redeem this tragedy in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Liz. Wow. <laughs> uh, I got two, uh, yeah, did you want to say something, Carol? Come on up here. No, right now. Right now is it. <laughs> you sweetheart. <laughs> Everybody say, hey, Carol. Hi. Um, so <clears throat> we didn't really fast. We, uh, I got the COVID at the beginning of January and we had to put our cat down and just with all that stuff. Anyway, um, so when, uh, yeah, and we didn't exactly give up TV or what? <laughs> yeah. We did give up sugar. Yes, we did. <laughs> so when Tim was, <laughs> when Tim was saying that he was going to have testimonies this morning, my thought was, well, psh, we don't have a testimony. I mean, we binge watched movies and we did everything wrong for the Daniel fast. And as I was sitting there, I felt like God was saying, you do have a testimony. Because despite the fact that we didn't follow the Daniel fast um, and I didn't have many quiet times, um, the Lord did some inner healing in me and revealed some things to me despite all that, um, and it was, his grace was just so felt that whole time, and so my testimony is that because we are part of a community of believers, some of you were fasting, and we received from that, I received from that, so it's the power of community, and um, it isn't only ourselves that bring about our transformation, that it's the community of the believers. And when some of the soldiers are battle fatigued, other soldiers step in so that we're never at the, at the mercy of the enemy. So thank you. <laughs> we're That's grateful. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. I love that. All right, who wants to go first, Jeff or Sharon? Sharon, you come up here. Everybody say, hey, Sharon. Well, um, I remember sitting with Brian and Mark. Yeah. <laughs> um, back on on the ninth of this month when it was the day before we started the fast and we were in small groups talking about kind of what we're trusting the Lord for in this time and I was with Ryan and Gina and <clears throat> I'm one of those that was a little apathetic about the whole eating part because that's part of my addiction so um, I was like well I want to focus on leaning into the Lord more and I, I really felt like God is not so much about what we did or didn't do. He's just always faithful. And so I really appreciate his faithfulness. And um, I want to give a little background about me. Um, 
we talk about attachment styles, and mine is anxious, um, distracted, which basically means I'm always looking for attachment, but I'm not really sure if I'm going to get it or not. And so that's the anxious part. And so I grew up with 12 other siblings and some uh, overwhelmed parents who didn't know much about meeting our emotions or attachment styles for that matter. So even so, the anxious part is especially true if I have unrealistic expectations that others will meet all of my attachment. So seeing more and more that I need to have an attachment with God and with people. So I struggled in relationships all of my life, longing for more deeper heartfelt connection um, people sh really sharing deep in their conversations. And it's actually um, often negatively affected my um, fun times with people. I can be having a good time, but I have this, this I would call it obsession with um, deeper connection. Um, and God has really blessed me with some dear relationships that I really value and really appreciate. So ironically, recently, I was on a, a vacation in a really warm, beautiful place with fun people, and I had a lot of laughter. And um, at the same time, my heart was longing for that deeper connection. I wanted to talk about more deep things. And um, also, in a different environment, I have a little, a, a much harder time connecting with the Lord because I'm, you know, that. That anxious, distracted, that kind of affects other parts of my life, too. And so I often, like, need my little chair and my space so that I'm not distracted by other things around me. So I was suffering in my times with Jesus during that vacation as well as my times with people. So um, last Monday I was like, okay, so when something seems out of balance... Am I willing to look at what the discontent, discontent is all about? Or am I just going to go, yeah, that's how it is, that's how it's always been, you know, kind of attitude. And so I felt like for the first time this last Monday, I was able to see clearer my part in the attachment pain that I was feeling. And um, Jesus was calling me to come to him. He was encouraging me to look at what the wall was in my, um, that was in the way of my deeper relationship with him. So as I was later in the morning interacting with Jesus about this in a focused Emmanuel time with our counselor and with Jeff, I felt like le that Jesus was saying, I'm always here for you. Ready to listen. I'm that friend who is always waiting to be with you. I have a lot of important things to share with you. And I was reminded that he holds gifts for me. So when our counselor Andy, Andy reminded me that he holds gifts for me, I kind of lost it because in that moment I remembered there was a gift that I felt like God had promised to give me that I hadn't yet received. And that hit me in a hard way, and I realized that that was the wall in my way, in the way of me enjoying deeper times with the Lord. And, like, I've had great times, but there was, I just knew there was something there. And so God um, <clears throat> brought that to mind. And then, as Jesus would do, he invited me to sit with him so we could talk about it. And then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, we're going to work this out. You're not going to miss out. He then took my hand and he said, let's do this together. So to me, it was really, really encouraging to see how he met me in that. So I just really was able to see that I was expecting others to meet my felt need when first I needed to remember my true source was getting filled up by him, not having an expectation of disappointment, but one of fulfillment. And that would make my times with him more of what I longed them for them to be. As I receive what I need from Jesus, I can then be at peace and enjoy times with others. As I have more to give because I've been cared for, delighted in, and filled up by Jesus. 
So I'm believing that this is a much needed breakthrough for me. And Jeff, being a recovering dismissive, was quite thrilled to see my eyes opened to the part that I get to play in not living anxious in my relationship with him as well. So the first week of the Daniel fast, I read 2 Corinthians 5.17 out of the Passion. And it says, now if anyone is enfolded in Christ, he has become an entirely new person. And enfold is not a word I normally use, so I looked it up and it says, to be held lovingly in one's arms. So I read that the first week of the fast. This last week, I experienced it. Being in the arms of Jesus and being held by him. And um, so when I lean into Jesus, which I shared was my goal, I really felt like that gave me more of what my heart was longing for. And so this morning when I read Tim's devotional about magnificent obsession, I really thought, wow, that's really awesome because I went from being obsessed about connection to being one with him in a greater way and getting connection with others as well. That makes me want to cry, man. How many of you have fought for, you know, basically there's so much fear and hurt that has been kind of built up inside our souls over so many years and to chip away and to have the Holy Spirit chip away at those things so that we can break through and have intimacy with God and each other. I mean, this is the greatest longing, greatest need of our lives is attachment. And so we're fighting through all of our dysfunctional attachment styles, our coping mechanisms, and to see that breakthrough for you, Sharon, is just like been in, that's like an answer to prayer. And that's a lot of siblings you got raised with. That's, that, that's a lot of waiting for the toilet. Like, I don't even know how you survived something like that. That's just incredible. So this is why we want to be gentle with each other. Very gentle, very kind, because none of us know the depth of the iceberg of the pain that we've all experienced. So that's why we're going to create a culture of affection and a culture of acceptance and love because it, it kind of begins to, by osmosis, we begin to pick up the sunlight and thaw out and get healed. And so I am just so for personally proud of you, Sharon, because you've been in a battle for a long time. And I know it's not, you know, there's going to be other times and other things. We're all still on a journey, but you are my hero. And I just want to say thank you for fighting and fighting and fighting and being patient with Jeff. Oh, never mind. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Jeff, get up here. <laughs> wow, what an intro. That's terrible. Everybody say, hey, Jeff. <laughs> so now you want to know the other half of the story. All right. So um, so if... If you're familiar, for those of you who may not be familiar with attachment styles, another attachment style that she mentioned is dismissive, where you never really learn to attach from your parents, and so you kind of shut off the whole relationship thing. So I'm, that's, that's the journey I'm on. So I, uh, so I had an opportunity to do a retreat uh, during the Daniel Fast, and I, uh, during the Retreat. I listened to and read this book by uh, by Gary Keller called The One Thing. So if you ever heard of Keller Williams Realty, so Gary Keller started this real estate firm from scratch and built it to be the biggest real estate firm in the country. So if I'm going to read a book by somebody, it's you know somebody who's like who's done something, you know. So so the book's called The One Thing, and. Uh, and the premise is, if you like focus on a lot of things, you'll really get nothing because you're dissipated. So he said, really think about 
the one thing that's important and do that. So I was praying about that, and I go, okay, Lord, what do you say the one thing? And, of course, he's given us, you know, something very clear is love God and love other people. You know, that's like the, the greatest and the second greatest commandment. And, um, and as in the loving other people department, if you're married, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 5 that marriage is a reflection of Christ in the church. But um, I, for anybody here that's married, have you found that to be sometimes kind of hard to do? <laughs> is to have your relationship reflect Christ in the church. So, so basically what uh, God said to me is that's what your one thing should be to work on. And, um, and one of the things in the book is he said, if you really want to grow in something be, ex you know, figure out what your one thing is and then be extreme and be all in in that. Be out of balance in a sense. And, um, but the thing is, if, you d if you're all in on what's really important, then uh, you can really have a shift. You can have a breakthrough instead of an incremental shift. So I want to tell a story about... Um, there's this doctor in California named Dean Ornish. He happened to be Steve Jobs' physician. When you're Steve Jobs, you can hire, like, the best doctor in California. And um, so here's what Steve Jobs observed, is that people that have, you know, clogged arteries, you know, if you're going to have a heart attack and die, unless they, so they put a little stint in. But if you don't change your lifestyle and your, your diet and your exercise and all, it's not going to hold. You can only put so many stints in, and then you're going to die. So basically, doctors say to their parent, patients, change or die. All right? So they did a study, and, the, and here's what they found. For people whose doctors said change or die, three years later, 80% of people were dead. Because even though they were told change or die, they didn't change, and, and that happened to them. So Dr. Orney says, well, that isn't acceptable. What can we do to help people have a better success rate? So um, you'll, hard this, you'll find this hard to believe. What he figured out is people, we need to create community for people that are all going through this same thing. And he said, let's have people be in small groups and be intentional about making this change. And so he had to meet with life coaches and figure out what their why is. Like, why do you want to live? Well, I want to see my grandkids grow up, or I want to, he helped people get in touch with their why. And then he had people together do their exercises and together make these really hard changes in what they're eating. And they did it as a community. And so he did this little experiment. So five years later, 90% were still alive. So it's one thing to just say, for a doctor to say to somebody, change or die. It's another thing to help somebody change. And, and here's an interesting thing you're actually more likely to change if you make a radical change than just like, well, I'm going to try harder and do a little, a little tweaking. That you're more likely to change if you make a radical change and then you're all in, you get with some other people that are doing the same thing and you just say, I'm going to radically change what I'm doing. So I guess that's my invitation that God gave to me is, okay, you're making incremental change in your relationship. How about if you're all in and just be radical about that? So we'll see how this year goes, but that's the invitation that, that God gave me, and I'm excited about what he's going to do.
Wow. So, as Jeff's friend and pastor, um, Jeff's a part of our leadership team, our MKF leaders, so I have lots of time weekly with Jeff. And by, uh, by virtue of my connection with him and Sharon, um, I have the privilege then of being one of those people in his life, in his support circle, that can constantly be contending for this big leap into greater attachment with Sharon Ruth. And so I get to share in the blessing of that. I get to share in the eternal reward of that, even though he gets to do the lion's share of the work. I get to be involved and partner with him and basically sync my, I get to co-regulate with him. So if I'm in a good place and he feels and watches me attaching to Janet, he has a visual aid of watching another man contending for intimacy. And then, then what will happen is there will be other people. There's other people in his first sphere of relationship. So, so what will happen is, is that Sharon and Jeff will both report a significant breakthrough in 2022 because of the intentionality. And the, and the minute you get into that kind of intentionality, you attract grace. That's the thing. He's not going to do this without Jesus. Nobody's going to change without Jesus, honestly, right? We're just actually, you know, the, everybody thinks that we're evolving in, in the human race. It wasn't that long ago the Holocaust took place. Like it was only 70 years ago. Six million Jews and other, and other minority groups were being killed. The human race isn't evolving. That's a, that's a fantasy. Evolution is like this is a fan. So it's un unless Jesus inserts himself like this and we cooperate with it, we won't see transformation. So I like this comment, uh, change or die. Um, and one time, one of our members that I love dearly, who's in this room, came up to me and said, uh, you know, now and then I will say something like this. The gospel is life and death. Attachment and relationship and intimacy is a matter of life and death. And the person came up and said, you know, Tim, sometimes when you talk like that, it causes me to question your credibility. It seems a little extreme. It seems a little, you know, like over the top. Come on, you know, really? And then, then one of the employees in his company took their own life. And it had to do with attachment pain, subcortical acute attachment pain. That is why people self-destruct. And so he comes back pale white, very emotional, and said, everything you've been saying is true. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm so great. I'm saying that the reality of a connection with Jesus and each other really is a matter of life and death. It's not just an option. It really, the, the earth is waiting for a radical group of people that love well, right? The earth is waiting for that. Now, how hard is that going to be? All hell is going to be warring against this. You know what I'm saying? Hell is going to come and plant weird thoughts in people's minds, maybe even yours. So we're not going to get out of this thing without a fight. So here's the paradox. We do fight for love. You really do fight for love. There really is um, a fight of faith into the grace of God. But it's, it's so fun. I want to just say I'm so honored to enter into this year with you guys and with the other members of our Rock Tribe in Kansas City and El Paso and Colorado, which is represented here, uh, and Kirkland, and obviously here in, in Wyoming. I'm so honored because we have a group of people that are beginning to capture the vision of the kingdom and the vision for love and the vision for disciple making. And um, so here I do, I think that the word of the Lord from Jeff prophetically to us is, <laughs> it's going to sound a little crazy, change or die. Radically embrace a new level of discipleship this year. And that's going to, you can't grow outside a community. 
So try to pray for God to give you somebody that is intentionally committed to you. Now you got to know I'm intentionally committed to you. I can't, I can't spend a couple of hours every day with everybody because there's not that many hours in the day. But I am intentionally committed to you personally. You got somebody like that. Plus you have the senior leadership team here. But then find some other people that can get in your life in a DNA group in MKF. We are showing up here on Wednesday nights. Uh, we got Mother Mary. Mother Mary. And we've got Nancy and Larry, and we've got Bob and Diana. We have a, we have a group of people showing up in this room every Wednesday. We eat a meal, and we sit around the table, and we bond and we fight for more of Jesus. You got that option. We've got micro churches going on right now with the Watsons, with uh, the Lawrences. We've got a closed one in the Newburns. We've got um, Batemans also, and we have a new baby in the house, Theodore, and so Teddy. Uh, so we have the youth group, the youth MKF with Derek leading and uh, the Bullers leading. And Robin Renda we mentioned too. So there's places to plug in and get that radical sense that I want to become like Christ more this year. I want to surge. Then here's another one. Pray for somebody to invest in. If you don't have somebody in your own mind, now obviously if you're if you got kids, they're your first, they're your first focus. But pray for some other people. Because when you flow out, more comes in. I've learned more by teaching and more by disciple making others than I've ever had being discipled. So the key to breaking the code of growth is helping somebody else grow. All right? So we're going to now pray. Um, and God bless Renda. She's coordinated an agape meal that we're going to get to enjoy. I love you. Be sure you hug up on Renda and thank her for all that she does in our family. She just loves us and loves you. So would you just stand with me right now and let's let's get together. We're going to move move across the aisles. Hold hands or get your arms around somebody. You can go wash them then for, you know, so you don't give somebody else your cooties. Yeah. And those of you watching, I trust that you've heard the Lord through these testimonies today, through every person. It's really important that we hear God through people's testimonies. Okay. Are you ready? All right. Father, we dedicate this year to transformation into Christ-likeness, to, to being a disciples and to making disciples, and to a kind of a do or die mindset, so we don't play around and coddle sin. We don't flirt with it. We don't excuse ourselves or rationalize. We don't tolerate compromise. We want to move into a place of happy holiness and fiery love. And so today, Father, unleash revival level grace and presence, you're an all-consuming fire. You're not ambiguous. You are the ultimate attacher. There's not a dismissive atom in your being. There's not an anxious atom in your being. There's not a distracted or a, what's the other one, disorganized. Thank you, Adam, in your being. You are the ultimate bonder. You love us in our weakness. So I loose now, God, the, the substance of a disciple-making movement that's Bible-based, Holy Spirit-led, Christ-centered, grace-based, alive, fun, joy-filled, joy-filled, joy-filled people 
joy-filled, contagious, contagious, Jesus contagion. And now bless this food. Bless the remainder of the year. Prosper and bless us as we move forward in being radical lovers of God and people, even our enemies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God.